Hello, and welcome back to Prism and Company. On the docket today, I wanted to talk you guys through the wands in the Ocean Dry Tarot. Now, this deck is obviously a pip deck, so there isn't a huge amount of information to talk through, but I did make a lot of decision decisions, hello, while uh, creating this deck, and I wanted to talk about why I chose to depict each card in the way I did. And then we'll talk kind of through the suit and, you know, do the, the miners and the court cards. So we'll talk each card individually and then kind of the suit holistically and see what is to be derived from that. This should be pretty fun. Um, these kinds of videos I've been looking forward to making just so I can, you know, uncover a little bit of that stuff that artists so rarely talk about with their work. I so, so, so often want there to be a little white book specifically dedicated to the art. Why did you choose those symbols? Why did you choose, you know, this color or that color or this meaning? And, you know, sometimes artists might not have all those things put together, but a lot of times they do. And they just, for whatever reason, don't tell us. Maybe the deck creator hired the artist so they're more interested in what they have to say rather than what the artist is bringing. Maybe they want to leave it esoteric and, you know, have the the meanings be hidden or uncovered, you know, through your own personal digging. Regardless of what it is, that is not what I'm interested in. I want to be transparent about the choices that I made and the things that I have, you know, kind of brought to the table here. If you have any additional questions, if there are things that I don't answer, please let me know. I would be more than happy to come back and give you another taste of some more information. Um, being withholding is not something that I'm interested in. So without further ado, let's get started. Alrighty then, first up is the Ace of Wands. Now I wanna take a peek uh, briefly at the color choices that I made and also the visual choices that I made too. I guess color choices are visual choices, but the, the compositional choices that I made. Now, if you saw my video on the color palettes, you'll know that I didn't necessarily like pick the color palettes. It was very systematic in the way that it all kind of broke down. But I did specifically assign each one of these created palettes of three to the cards. So I very intentionally chose red, orange, and yellow for the Ace of Wands here. Now this one was the first color palette that I chose and by far the most obvious to me, I wanted the colors of fire, red, orange, and yellow to be the Ace of Wands. It's so perfect. It is the most explosive -y, fiery card that you could have in a tarot deck. And the image is kind of fairly simple too. All of the aces, I want it to feel very explosive. So we have this set kind of rectangle in the background and immediately, like this was the very first card I drew in the deck and obviously I broke the border of that card. I needed this card to be expanding and pulsing and, and just exploding past any bounds that I could possibly give it. So I really made sure to like very intentionally blow out the sides of this rectangle. Now, in many cards, I will stick more firmly to the rectangle, but this one just felt like it needed to go. Now, interestingly, I'm going in kind of like a not, not realistic order for the colors for fire. If this was real fire, the core of it would be yellow. It would be extremely hot, and the hotter fire gets, it gets towards white and then eventually blue, um, and then it cools down to orange and red and so forth as it cools off. So if this was like an actual explosion, it would be yellow to orange to red. Now, I tried it a whole bunch of different ways, but just visually to me, this felt more explosive, like there's a core of something, and then it's kind of dissipating as it goes. Fire is very transparent, so even as fire cools down and becomes darker, it naturally becomes more transparent and fades into the background. So that does the same visual effect as what's happening here. The yellow is more visually transparent, in this case against white, than red would be. So it is kind of doing the same thing that fire would do by dissolving away into the background. So this was more of a, a visual conceit and wanting to get the intention of what fire is and not necessarily the physics of how color and fire work. Okay, cool. Let's take a look at number two. Let's kick things off with the color palette. We have really hot fire here. We have orange and yellow. So it's bright, it's brilliant. Um, this card for me is very much about like charging forward and moving, not any consideration of sustaining at this point. It is just flicking and flaring and moving. So we just have that really bright vibrantness to it. 
in the background we have darker purple so it's not really even the fire at this point it is more the backdrop upon which the fire is at and for me the fire doesn't even care about the backdrop here again it's that that bustling that moving forward and just kind of going so in many ways like this background is not even that fiery if you think about that ace you know it was bursting off the page this is very much just kind of abstract brush strokes the fire is all happening right here in between these two sticks. I imagine like rubbing two sticks together to start fire. We could even turn this card on its side and almost see like a campfire setup where we have the fire below this stick but on top of this stick, placing it visually right in the center. So it's very much that friction point that I was hoping for and I think it came across pretty darn well. All right, cool. With that, let's take a look at the next. There's gonna be some things in this video that just get lost in translation. There's a lot of small details on these cards that don't reproduce great, whether it is on Instagram or on YouTube. So, you know, I can try, but you'll just have to take my word a little bit for it. Oh boy. Um, in this card, one of my favorite things, boy, you really can't see it much, are these little leaves growing up. Threes for me are very much about growth. So this is warm, soft fire, almost like spring. So I made sure to include a lot of little, very subtle, delicate uh, branches growing up to kind of indicate that, but they're still in fiery colors. They're very much part of this kind of fiery schema. Now, the color palette, I should have started there. Um, we have uh, the gray, we have orange, and we have yellow. So we have a very like grounded fire at this point. Um, this is, you know, soft and glowing and growing, unlike two, which doesn't care about its context. This is very much set in its context. And then even the wands themselves, are, you know, kind of in that context too. These two wands set the stage, they are the ground, and this one wand is growing out of it. So it is kind of like reaching up. And then in the background, we have the fire kind of swirling. We have the orange to yellow, again, doing the same visual thing as the ace does with fire kind of cooling off and becoming more transparent as it goes, but not nearly as much bursting. This fire is much more soft and contained. Another thing that I like is the little loop around the top of this wand here. This is kind of speaking to like the higher aspects of fire in some ways to me. We're not really, you know, we're still early in the suit, so it's not really developed fire. This is still very much like conceptual in some ways. So that kind of speaks to that, that higher element. We have that very bright yellow at the top that is not in any way contaminated by the orange around it. I love the Three of Wands. It has such a special place in my heart. I, it's one of my birth cards and it just, it makes me smile and I'm really glad it turned out the way it did. I like it a lot. All right, let's take a peek at the next. Alrighty, color palettes first. This card to me is Cold Fire. If you have watched my How I Read Tarot video and for that I use the Cold Fire colors. Um, I'm really kind of treating red, orange, and yellow as heat within the suit of fire. Red is the coldest fire, but the most stable fire. Um, orange is somewhere in the middle, and yellow is hot, bright, vibrant fire that kind of waves and flickers in the wind. And then gray very much becomes context or stability. Now we're at a four here, so having that very stable gray along with, you know, cold, stable fire, I think makes perfect sense. The gray is also representing smoke in this case, so it's kind of like smoldering, smoky fire. So that is pouring off of this center rectangle and kind of smearing off the edges. Now then we have the wands, which are all overlapping here in a square. Again, creating a stable environment. Oh, I can't make a square apparently. I'll just point at the square that's already there. <laughs> Super duper. Um, everything is kind of internalized within this. Now, obviously the color is bleeding out of that. That is more of a conceit to the a design choice that I made with the composition of these cards, but the real fire is kind of inside of this. And you can even see the fire swirls a little bit inwards. Visually, it's really trying to make you look into this square of wands that we have. And then outside of that, I really tried to keep it fairly red, just to, again, ground that down a little bit. Just a little pop of orange for a, a little visual interest. Beautiful. Um, with that, let's take a look at another. Whoa. 
my setup does not lend itself particularly well to coming down from the top. So I had to do some contortionist antics. Okay, I'm actually gonna stop myself right there because Colin, you did not do contortionist to anything. You leaned forward slightly farther than usual to get your hand on top of the screen and then pulled down. So you can just go ahead and calm right down. That aside though, let's take a look at the color palette for the five here. Now again, we're dealing with kind of cold fire. We have red and orange, but we've replaced the gray for the purple. I almost said brown there for many years. Gray was brown in this deck and that switch to gray was kind of a, not a last minute choice, but a, a down the line choice. So I might actually say brown sometimes. Now, again, if we think of gray as very grounded and stable, purple is not that. Purple is much more like backdrop, but it is ephemeral backdrop. The two, remember, was, you know, careening on past, not caring about context. Here, the five is very, like, chaotic and disruptive, and these wands are, like, clashing together, and it's about the fire, but it's just, like, in a space. It's not grounded. It's, it's flowing. It's floating. It's everywhere. Now, that's also kind of reinforced by the colors bleeding out of the side here. Even the background almost like working its way in. I really like this mark. I think just as a, an image, that mark is very successful. But it also helps to like breathe a little bit of oxygen into this card. Kind of like cut the fire a little bit. And, you know, definitely at the, the crossings of the wands here, you can see that there's a little bright clash of fire. That's the hottest in this image, at least, because it's orange. You can almost see like lightsaber style, pew, pew, the, the wands crashing and exploding or popping a little bit. And then the further they get away from each other, that fire cools back into that dark purple. And then at the top here, you know, heat rises, so it does go towards red a little bit, but it never really gets hot in the background. There's really just kind of space holding it together. And like not even all the wands are touching. There's like something happening here. There's a, an element happening here. And visually it rolls together because these two large wands are going in the same direction, but even the wands themselves are disjointed. Everything's trying to lead you to not feeling very stable in this image, not feeling comfortable. It's all about kind of separating things away. Alrighty. All right, onto the six. I just love sixes in a tarot deck. They are among my favorite numbers. Threes are also amazing. Oh, so are sevens and nines are cool. I kind of like everything, but sixes have a sweet spot in my heart. And for me, they're very much about rising. And I think it's pretty clear that this card is rising. Now let's talk colors first. So we have grounded gray, we have cold, stable red fire, and bright, brilliant yellow fire. So this card is like the best of both worlds, Hannah Montana style, because we're grounded, we are burning, but we're also hot. Fire is like firing on all cylinders here, doing what it wants to do. Now this card, I actually included a small triangle. Let's see if I can, oh, I just trimmed my nails and boy, I can't think of anything. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little triangle right there above these ones, but below the second ones. And I don't use symbols very often in this deck, uh, specifically in the minors, because I really wanted the, the pips to kind of speak for themselves and the colors to kind of speak for themselves but every now and then I include a little bit of something something. Here we have the triangle of fire. So it's really reinforcing that this is like a fiery card in the way that fire kind of wants to be. If you think of a campfire, that's like a perfect analogy here because it is stable and grounded. There's fuel, it's not moving anywhere, but it has, you know, if you stack logs like this, plenty of airflow, plenty of upward movement for the fire to rise. It's doing its thing. It is fire doing fire's thing and it's happy. Now, there is some visual conceit here um, for composition's sake. Like for example, the gray on the top is just there more to kind of set the stage. Um, the gray on the bottom is a bit to ground this image but it's not like we're looking at a scene. So I wasn't worried about like, oh no, the gray is like too high on the image. Like it wouldn't be that high if it was, like, was an actual fire. So I, I do nod at that sometimes. Like on the five, I nodded at that a little bit with the fire kind of getting more red towards the top, but not always. Um, it really kind of came down to what the composition needed. And really 
you know, with a stage like that dark gray, your eye is really drawn to the bright elements. So we're kind of getting brighter and brighter, really kind of moving your eye towards that triangle in the center. And then of course we have the, I don't think I specifically mentioned it, but the bright yellow fire kind of like whipping and flailing, really kind of like describing the movement of what the six does, which is this like whip up. It's, you know, upward movement, but it's not necessarily stable. The same way that you might see a flick of fire come off the top and not necessarily stick together all that long. Now, the that is reinforced by the shape too. So the bottom two wands are not touching. They are pointing up, but they're not forming like a solid cross like the top ones are. So the rising part on top here, these four, that is stable. That is what's happening in this card, but it's not fully stabilized yet because a six is about rising. It is not about stability in that way, at least for me. So that is what's happening in the six. I feel like I got a little rambly on that one. A lot of folks have been very curious about this seven. I think the organization of these pips is not at all what other tarot decks have done. And it, something about it seems kind of like occulty and evocative. When I look at it, the, the first thing that kind of comes to mind is like something you might see like the Blair Witch Project. Like it seems like weird and like evil almost, which is certainly not the intention, but I think it, it does have that vibe in some ways. And also because of the colors too. We have, you know, the dark colors of the suit plus like the medium bright orange. And orange and gray and, you know, in many ways, orange and purple are also very Halloween-y colors. So everything about this card is trying to, or is currently screaming like, it's dark and spooky, even though say la Now back to the colors here for a second. We have very grounded gray, and where grounded has been really good in some cards, here it's about kind of getting like rooted or stuck. Then we have that ephemeral purple, and the wands this time are made out of that purple because the action of this card is halted in many ways. So it's trying to do a thing, but it's not really getting there. And then we have this orange because there is fire and movement in this card, but it's happening in a very like resistancey, staticky way. So it's more like friction heat as opposed to fire heat. And all of that friction heat is happening above um, these they're above this one down here. There's a tiny, 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 tiny bit at the bottom, but the vast, vast majority is happening right here. So for me, the Seven of Wands is all about that resistance, trying to like move towards something, but you're just hitting a wall. So here we have our wand moving forward, hitting the wall. And then even if it were to get past that, you know, it's not like it's a, a wall it can't see past. So even if it could get past this, it can see on the other side, we have two wands crossing. And then we have other wands weaving themselves and they're kind of going in and out of each other, really locking up, making sure that you can't really move it. And then beyond that, we have what could be a couple of different things depending on your read. This could be the wand kind of like heading up all of these down here, the, the master of the army that is opposing you. Or this could be this wand on the other side. It has made it or it is envisioning itself making it. It all depends. Um, that is kind of reinforced by this tiny bit of orange. We can see this wand has a little bit of momentum behind it. And then here, if it is that same wand, it has more momentum behind it to continue forward. It's also breaking out of that black smock, as obviously they do on the sides here as well. I also have a little bit of gray on the edge of each of these wands, just to kind of, again, root them down. They are going off of this dark space, but I wanted to make sure that they still felt really solidly placed. Cool. Let's take a look at the eight. Now the eight, I was very inspired by graffiti. There's something about the act of making graffiti, doing graffiti. I don't know what the, the verb is for one who creates graffiti, but whatever that is, there's something very active about that process. It's fast, it is tactile, it is kinetic. You spray, you have to keep moving, you can't linger. It's not like a delicate oil painting where you're, you know, going over the same thing for six and a half hours. It's like, no, you got to spray it and it goes and then it dries quick. So that very kind of kinetic movement, it's, a little, it's hard to see even in person, honestly. There's lots of like single lines that kind of loop around or scribble across the surface. In retrospect, I would have probably made the purple and the gray look more visually distinct, but here we are. This is one of the only cards where it's really an issue. 
Um, and then also on top of the graffiti aspects, like visually with movement, I wanted to make it look like these ones were all stenciled. So you cut up a stencil of the graffiti and you spray over the top with yellow and you can see just the area of kind of where the wand would be. I also liken this to how science currently sees electrons and atomic movement, because I don't know if this has actually changed, but when I was going through school at least, you couldn't actually see an electron. All you could see was where an electron was. And then, you know, obviously you can make decisions and things and observations based off of that. But here we're not seeing the wands. We're seeing where the wands were. They have moved on since then. They've probably rotated or shifted or whatever. The eight is very much a, a kinetic card for me. It's movement based. It's, it's unpredictable. It's all over the place. Now, the color choices here are interesting because they, in my mind, they fit the mold, but they're they're interesting. Let me say interesting a few more times. Um, here we have gray and purple. So we have the very foundational set in stone colors. And we have that gray almost forming the backdrop of this card. Because even with like chaotic kinetic movement, there's still like a context in which that happens. There is still a wall upon which graffiti is drawn. And then purple kind of reinforces the space of that. So it is the context but like mixed very inherently with the space. And then obviously the yellow are these like impermanent shadows that we're seeing over the top or glows or lens flares, whatever you want to call it. And I really like when these go off of the background and it almost looks like they're made of pure light, like they're just glowing bright yellow with their glow sticks or something. Cool card. Um, this is the one that I think is least successful only because of the color reproductions and I did it in a way that's really hard to fix. So I don't know if it's going to change or not. But is what it is. I'm still very happy with it. And I think they're pretty cool. Okay, cool. Let's take a look at the nine. I think if I asked you guys at this point, you could probably talk me through why I use these colors. Um, they're fairly systematic in the way that I kind of chose them. And there is some variation in there. But it's almost like a math problem. Like what is it? Purple plus red plus yellow. And it was really fun to to do that math, if you will, while applying these different color palettes to the different cards. Um, so let's talk it through though. Purple is our context. This card for me is very much in space. It is moving. Um, the nine is not grounded in any way. It is, it's doing its thing and charging forward. Red is this very like stabilized color again and yellow. So here we have red and yellow returning from the six, but we've now replaced these the stable gray with the unstable purple. This card is like a lightning bolt crashing through. It is, you know, endless, unyielding momentum. It is the final push breaking through the wall. And that's what we can see depicted here too. We see these wands that are charging forward, all creating this one unified point, And they are trying desperately to get through all of this resistance. These wands that are horizontally stacked up and you know, in my mind anyway, they'll get through. Like, you can definitely, if you want to, focus on the resistance in this. That's the beauty of tarot cards. Like, you can read into it whatever you like. But for me, you know, I wanted to make sure to put this, like, bright yellow punches behind it. Showing, like, the explosion almost behind the hero. Like, in slow motion. Blah, as it, like, goes forward. And then this is kind of the explosion on the other side. Blah, as it crashes through. Now we also have a halo around the wands up top here. Again, just kind of emphasizing that explosion through. Boy, this is tapping into like my nine-year-old like, yeah, monster trucks, like explosions and bad guys. And I'm making sound effects to prove it. Um, I think this is one of the prettiest cards in the wands for me, just because the colors mix in a really satisfying, nice way. But there's also just all of this like, movement and like pulse to the background mixed with this very kind of static looking image on the front. It almost looks like a an easel that an artist might paint on in some ways. It, it's got a tripod on the bottom. It feels very kind of set in stone. And then there's all this action happening too. And whether or not that was ultimately successful with the nine is fine and up for debate, whatever. But I just think visually it looks really, really satisfying. And I like that little extra hint of the halo at the top. <sighs> On to the 10. 
the ten of wands. There it is. Okay, cool. <laughs> I knew we'd get there eventually. Um, the ten. Let's take a look at our math problem up top here. And oh, it's not great. We have really stable gray, we have ephemeral purple, and we have cold but stable red. This card ain't moving anywhere. We also have the visual theme from the nine of those horizontal staffs, which again are the resistance. They're not going anywhere. Even we saw it in the seven. Everything in this card gets you to stop. Um, the gray and purple in the background is a solid rectangle. It's stopped. The gray bars over the top, almost like prison, stop you. And there's all this red that is like trying to escape behind it. It is like peeling off the side in these like billows. I almost imagine smoke like pouring through the bars, but ultimately the mass of red is hidden behind here. It is not moving, it is not doing anything. And there is a little bit of a, a flare up on top here, but that I think that's more of a compositional conceit than anything. Um, I like what ended up happening with these colors. It feels dark and dense and heavy, and I think tens should. Tens can mean all sorts of things, but I think that there is a density to them that is kind of undeniable. And I think that density is reached really well here. Also, I will say that I totally kind of stole this composition from the Masonic Tarot, which has, oh, the most glorious nine of wands that you've ever seen. And that is in my excavating the Masonic Tarot videos that I posted a little while ago. So you can go see it there if you like. But it always felt a little bit odd to me there because it does seem so structured and so immovable. Like you could read this potentially as a ladder, but just visually to me, this always reads more as like bars or things that are stacked up and not moving. So I decided to take that visual theme and put it on the 10. Alrighty. Um, we're gonna take a quick peek at the courts and then we will examine the entire deck together, the entire deck, the entire suit together and see just kind of like visual themes that carry across. I am looking forward to it. Princess. Now, the colors in the court cards don't necessarily matter because it uses all of the colors from the whole suit. So they mean what they mean and you can just kind of read into it that stuff. So we, we could talk about it, but really like, I think where the colors showed up is more important than which ones I included because it's all of them. Now, all of the princesses have this visual theme of these very thin geometric lines running through them. And this is actually a reference to the suit of discs, something that we won't see for a few weeks here, but um, these lines show up in all of those cards in some way. So there's always these little elements of geometry that kind of work themselves into the discs in one way or another. And because princesses are the earthly part of their parent suit, I wanted to make sure that the discs were represented in that way. It also just helps to give the princesses a little bit of unique visual design too. So wands, uh, the princess of wands, I read very much as like fuel. So here we can see the fire kind of like, almost like lava, like pooling up at the bottom. Tons and tons of that context and that space in the background, because that is what the fire will eventually burn in. And here we can see fire kind of depicted in its like natural like state or like its normal colors, I suppose, because the really hot fire is yellow and then it bleeds into orange, red, purple, gray. So this is sort of fire depicted as normal, as we might see it as humans. That's just because I had the luxury of working with such a dark background. And then all of the geometry around it here, we have um, lines that are kind of growing up, almost like, this is really loose, but almost like trees in some way, like something that the fire could grow up on. But really, it is pointing at this gray wand in the center. That is really what's happening there. And gray, again, is our context. It is our fuel. This wand is about to burn. Now here in the prince, the wand is purple. And again, purple is all about like not necessarily being there. It's very ephemeral. And princes are air. So this card is very much about like that part of fire that's like volatile and flickers. So it makes sense that the, the wand itself would also be kind of ephemeral in that way. Obviously, visually it's depicted like the rest of the suit, but the color means that it is that more kind of ephemeral bit. 
We can also see that wind pushing the fire around the edge of this card. It's blowing in every direction. It is uneven. It's moving all over the place, especially this yellow burst coming down. It just feels dangerous. The Prince of Wands to me feels volatile. It feels dangerous. So I'm really glad that that kind of whipping sensation and also like these kind of sharp angles that are almost at odds with the square in the center or the rectangle in the center feel good too. Oh, something else I haven't been talking about. I actually smeared the colors from all of the um, dots on the top, the color palette dots, in specific ways too. And mostly it's just to reinforce the things we've been talking about. So don't worry, there's not like some other secret meaning here. But like here, for example, you can see all the dots are blowing this way as if this explosive fiery moment blew all the colors or is starting to blow all the colors. So you can see there it just is kind of fitting naturally into the composition when it can. All right. Oh, I have such a soft spot for the Queen of Wands. This is another one of my birth cards. If you did not know, in the Thoth system, you actually get three birth cards. You get one, which is the major, and that is based on whatever your zodiac sign is. So for me, that's the emperor. And then two of them are a court card and a minor card. Every single card in the Thoth deck is related to a time, a uh, time of the year specifically. So the courts are pretty big. They kind of reside over three minor cards. And then, like, so the, the Queen of Wands is residing over my part of the year. And then the Three of Wands is my specific sliver. It doesn't always match up where you get the same suit for both of your cards. It just so happened to match up for me. But that is irrelevant because we're talking about the Queen of Wands here. This is the liquid part of fire. It is the watery part of fire. So here we have that kind of like medium orange, the, the active moving part of fire. Also, of course, this refers to the color orange that is found in the suit of cups. If you want more information about how I chose all these colors besides just thematically within the suit, but also tying them to other suits, watch my color systems breakdown video. Um, I go more into depth about how all these things overlap and correlate with graphs. And I love graphs. Ah, graphs. But I really wanted to focus on the fluidity of the fire here. So all of the colors are mixing together. There's lots of movement and ebb and flow. And fire is kind of showing off here. It's being a little bit the showmany. Boy, there's not really a better word for that here. It's, it's flicking. It's flirting. It's trying to show you like, ooh, I'm beautiful. Look at my delicious fiery curves. We're done talking like this now. Thank you, Queen of Wands. Great. I bow to thee. We're done. The king is very much like a comet to me. So we have dense red fire that will not yield in the center. And all of our fire is starting at the top and just blasting its way down. Or you could see the fire blasting its way off too. I think either way it works. But it's very one-dimensional. It is fire going from top to bottom. It is moving its way down. And there is very, very little purple. It just shows up in tiny little bits at the bottom here because this card is all about the fire. Red, orange, yellow dominate this one because the kings are fire. So they're there. it is the fiery part of fire. Whoa, my tongue got a little bit tangled there because I was so intimidated by this fiery king. So regardless of how you read the king of wands, I think the idea that the king of wands would be extremely fiery is not hard to dispute. And visually, there's also some lines coming out. So all the colors kind of bleed into each other a little bit more. Again, that's just to reinforce the mm, intensity of the colors going into the other areas of the card. Now, let's take a look at the whole suit together and see just kind of like what it looks like at 30,000 feet. Um, actually, let me zoom out a little bit here. Ah, much better. And let's set up all the cards too. All right, looking at the entire suit together. Some things that kind of come across, we definitely have a very smoky feel to many of the cards. Um, in many ways, the ace kind of feels smoky, especially that corner with the red bleeding off. The four for sure feels intentionally smoky. And the 10 also feels smoky. And you can see those are going in opposite directions, mostly to just breathe a little bit of variation into the suit itself. Um, but a lot of 
sharp spilling off the edges, kind of keeping those fiery motifs as things spill off in little chunks and little pops and little bursts. Now that's very much my kind of abstract aesthetic, but it does lend itself well to fire as well. Now, one thing I tried to keep in mind, but in some ways fell through, was kind of like the journey through the suit as far as colors go. Now, I was far more concerned with like making sure that these three colors related to the two or the five or the seven, you know, whatever it might be. But I also wanted a little bit of like ebb and flow as you go. So we start really bright here with the uh, one, two, and three. And then we kind of get dark for a while. And then we you know, brighten up in some ways, but eventually just like settle into that real darkness. And then here with the court cards, we start off with just a little bit of fire and then it kind of like pops and smolders in different directions. So we have fire kind of like flickering throughout those court cards together. Another thing I'm not sure if I've talked about is that I made sure that each color got represented with the pips as well. So here we can see red and red being represented as the pips themselves. You can also see the number or letter on top reflects the color of the pips down below. We have yellow, yellow, yellow. We have orange and orange. We have purple and we have gray and gray. So all five of the colors are represented. I really wish I could have gotten all five colors to be represented in the courts as well, specifically with the pips, but I'm really happy with how that how that ended up working out with the way that those cross over. Cool, very fiery, almost too hot to touch, if you will, and I will, but I'm not going to anymore, <laughs> so we'll move on. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed. This has been really cool and really, really fun to kind of talk my way through some of those decisions that I made with each of these wands cards. Do you have a favorite? Any little bits that surprised you? I would love to hear any of that from you guys because I love chatting with you. And what a more exciting thing to chat, chat about than this thing that I've been working on for so long. Very cool. Uh, I'm going to leave these up just for a moment so you can kind of take a peek and gander at them. And then we'll move on to the next. Um, next time I see you guys, I will be talking cups. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye.